You're comparing yourself to these giants, but it doesn't really matter. Are you satisfied with what you have done? Because you have done a lot, actually. So why not just be happy with it? You're not Mozart. You're not Wagner. You're not Brahms. You're not Goethe. But you are you. Look at yourself and realize that you are actually doing something that has value. Not only for you, but maybe also for other people. If you realize that, there's nothing to be ashamed of. All right, welcome to this new video. Today, I'm going to talk about the Magic Theater. Now, the Magic Theater is the mysterious place that Harry has to enter to confront himself, to find himself, and to get over his trauma. Basically, just to get over himself. And we'll see how this works out. Now, the first thing I want to show you is this painting. It's interesting because it's a painting that Hermann Hesse did himself. And on this painting, we can see different shapes. It's a very, very creative, almost like psychedelic painting. And we can see all these like different colors and there's masks in there. There seem to be a lot of eyes in there. And there's a hand and there's hearts. So it just looks like a dream or like a fever dream, a hallucination. And the name of this painting is Maskenball. And Hermann Hesse himself painted it in 1926. Now Maskenball, that's like a costume ball, like a masked ball. You attend there in a costume and the whole point of going there in a costume is to not be your regular self. You actually take on a different personality. You become someone else and then you face people that you might know, but you actually don't recognize them because they are not who they usually are. And this also gives you a chance to reinvent yourself or basically to hide who you are from other people. Anyway, so the reason for this is Harry had been invited to this ball and the prerequisite was just to wear a mask. You cannot show up as who you are in real life. Now, the main theme in that magic theater is how to tame the wolf. So as Harry's ego has to learn how to tame and control the wolf. And the only thing he can learn this is just to descend into this magic theater. And now what he finds there is the reversal of the situation because he ends up being tamed by the wolf. So the wolf becomes the wolf tamer and Harry becomes the wolf that is tamed by the wolf, essentially. So you see like uh, these two roles are reversed, which means of course that they are basically two sides of the same coin. So what the wolf does there he instructs Harry and Harry's human ego to kill, to maul a rabbit to death. Now, this is weird because Harry has to take on his wolfish nature to commit an animalistic act and actually kill another animal just by biting it and killing it and tearing it to pieces with his teeth. And when this happens, Harry is shocked because he realizes, I had no idea I'm capable of that. How can I do something like that? Am I not this very civilized, this very cultured, sophisticated human being? I'm an author. I'm an intellectual. I had no idea I was capable of doing something like that. Such an animalistic act. Such brutality. That's not me. I'm a pacifist. But how can I do something like that? And he realizes, well, wait a minute. Maybe. Well, that's also what human nature is about because it's human nature and nature itself does not care about civilization, about being sophisticated, about being cultured, whatever. I am a part of nature and nature permeates everything, even civilization, because guess what? Civilization is a part of nature. And even if you try to keep out nature because you build walls around your city, around your society, around your civilization, around yourself. The one problem is that you as a human being are still in there and you are a part of nature. So even by trying to keep out nature, you take it wherever you go because you are nature. He realizes that. 
So there's no way to escape nature itself and human nature, which in itself also contains that animalistic part. And now Harry descends deeper into this maze that's underneath the city. Actually, it doesn't really exist. It's just a utopian kind of place. It only exists in his psyche. Basically, he descends into his psyche. What he does there, he can revisit his past. And he gets the chance to catch up with all the things that he had done wrong in the past. So one important aspect is to just face the people he had wronged before. And so there it says, like, alle Mädchen sind dein. All girls are yours. And what he gets to do is he meets his old crush from high school, Rosa. And they relive their relationship. So in a way, it's strange because time also doesn't exist in that magic theater. So it really is like a psychedelic, hallucinogenic state that he is in. So after he is done with Rosa, he relives all his romantic relationships. And he tries to make up for his shortcomings. He tries to make up for all the things he did wrong. And he tries to kind of get closure because he hurt so many people. He gets the second chance to redeem himself. And finally, he gets to like a big room and this room is full of mirrors. The most important thing that he can do in this magic theater is he can relive his past and he can rebuild his personality because he has a shattered personality, which is also a sign of the times. So what he has to do is basically he has to fall into the void. He has to descend into the void and just let go and just let himself fall down there. And then he can slowly remodel his own personality. He can just put all the pieces of his shattered psyche together. The problem is he has to face himself. And this is how he gets to this hall of mirrors. It's a big room and it's full of mirrors and he cannot escape himself. He has to inevitably face himself in one of these mirrors. So there's no way around it because it doesn't matter where he goes. He always sees his reflection somewhere. So he has to face himself eventually and he does it. And now he recognizes who he really is. And this is what has rights about this. Im großen Wandspiegel stand Harry mir gegenüber. Er sah nicht gut aus, er sah nicht viel anders aus, als er in jeder Nacht nach dem Professorenbesuch und dem Ball im Schwarzen Adler ausgesehen hatte. Aber das lag weit zurück, Jahre, Jahrhunderte. Harry war älter geworden, er hatte tanzen gelernt, hatte magische Theater besucht, er hatte Mozart lachen gehört. Er hatte vor Tänzen, vor Frauen, vor Messern keine Angst mehr. Auch der mäßig Begabte, wenn er ein paar Jahrhunderte durch Hand hat, wird reif. Lange sah ich Harry im Spiegel an. So he says, Harry faced himself in this big mirror on the wall. He didn't look good. Well, he didn't actually look that different from that night when he had this fight with the professor or when he visited the Black Eagle. Well, that was long ago. Years ago, hundreds of years ago. So you can see time doesn't exist here. It makes no sense. Harry got older. He had learned how to dance. He visited the magic theater. He heard Mozart's laugh. He was not afraid anymore of dances, of women, of knives. And even... The very, very normal human being, after a couple of centuries, will become mature. Harry looked at himself in the mirror very, very long. Noch kannte ich ihn wohl, noch immer glich er ein ganz klein wenig dem Harry von 15 Jahren, der an einem Märzsonntag in den Felsen der Rosa begegnet war und seinen Konfirmandenhut vorgezogen hatte. Und doch war er seit er einige hundert Jährchen älter geworden, hatte Musik und Philosophie getrieben und satt gekriegt, 
hatte im Stahlhelm Elsasser gesoffen und mit biederen Gelehrten über Krishna diskutiert, hatte Erika und Maria geliebt, war Herminens Freund geworden, hatte Automobile abgeschossen und mit der glatten Chinesin geschlafen, hatte Goethe und Mozart getroffen und verschiedene Löcher in das Netz der Zeit und der Scheinwirklichkeit gerissen, indem er noch gefangen war. Hatte er auch seine hübschen Schachfiguren wieder verloren, so hatte er doch ein braves Messer in der Tasche. Vorwärts, alter Harry, alter, müder Kerl. So he writes, I still know him, and he was still the same as when he was 15 years old in March on a Sunday when he met Rosa on the rocks. And he greeted her. But he got older, like a couple hundred years older. He engaged in music and philosophy. And he fed himself well. He drank as a kind of wine in the Stahlhelm restaurant's name. And he discussed Krishna with conservative scholars. He loved Erika and Maria, and he became Hermina's friends. He shot automobiles, and he slept with a smooth Chinese. He met Goethe, he met Mozart, and he tore different holes into the net of time and what is seemingly a reality. It's that net that he was caught in even though he repeatedly lost his pretty check figures. He still had a nice knife in his pocket. Go, old Harry. Go, you old, tired guy. So he looks in the mirror, and what he sees is his reflection, which is old and gray and tired. And then he gets into another theater, a world theater, It's Mozart's theater, and he meets Brahms, the composer, and Wagner. And Harry thinks, wow, I'm among these people, these geniuses of music. And, but I'm also an artist. And he realizes his hubris. Why does he realize? Because Mozart ridicules him. It's like, man, you're nothing. You're absolutely nothing. These people are geniuses. What are you? What have you done? Do people know you? No one knows you exist, actually. You compare yourself to these giants of culture. But you're just an imposter. You're a poser, nothing else. And he has to kind of like, he has to be humbled by these figures of worship, basically. And then... He realizes his own insignificance. And Mozart, he ridicules him even more. It's like, man, but you're still trying. I mean, you're doing something which is better than nothing. You're comparing yourself to these giants. But it doesn't really matter. Are you satisfied with what you have done? Because you have done a lot, actually. So why not just be happy with it? You're not Mozart, you're not Wagner, you're not Brahms, you're not Goethe, but you are you. Look at yourself and realize that you are actually doing something that has value. Not only for you, but maybe also for other people. If you realize that, there's nothing to be ashamed of. And then Harry walks on to the next door and he has a knife in his hand. He opens the door, and there's a room, and Hermine is in there. And what does Harry do? He takes his knife, and he stabs Hermine through the heart and kills her. And this is exactly what Hermine had told him. It was her prophecy, you will kill me. And at that time, Harry said, it's impossible. I would not ever do something like that. I'm not a killer. But he ends up in this self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, the whole scene is, of course, it's not real. It's a fantasy. It's a psychedelic dream. It's a hallucination. 
but still he ends up where he's supposed to be. That's very important. So what happens in this magic theater is the hero's quest, but it might also be like a reverse hero's quest. Basically, I mean, what's the hero's quest? I mean, you go in there, you put yourself in danger, you grow over time, and then you kill the dragon, get the dragon's gold. But here, he's not killing the dragon, he's killing Hermina. But by killing Hermina, he's also killing a part of himself, his anima. Now the problem is, you kill that part of yourself, you're killing an essential part of yourself. And this is not the outcome that the hero wants. It's not the result that the hero wants because this is not the goal that you can get. You end up being fragmented. So in a way, his goal is actually to restore a balance between his animus, his anima, and the shadow. So it's this triad, and he has to live with these parts. If you kill either one of them, you will end up in a state of imbalance. So what Harry ends up doing is actually he kills his anima, Hermina, and he will kill the wolf, his shadow. So in the end, what's left of him, what he has been before, the animus, the rational male part of his soul. And then he doesn't gain anything, he just goes back to square one. So this whole process, this whole hero's quest of growth, trials, adventure, and so on, has led him to where he was when he started this quest. Now what happens then, Harry is being tried. There's actually a trial, and they get like a guillotine in there, and he says, oh my god, now I'm going to be beheaded, is it like an execution, I'm, am I going to be sentenced to death? And of course, since it's like a, a hallucination, it's a dream, it's like a fever fantasy, everything turns out totally different. So what happens is, they try him because he killed Hermina. He's a murderer now. But he's being convicted because he murdered a mirrored girl. Which in that case also means it's not a real girl. It's the reflection of a girl. And the sentence is, and this is the funny part, although they bring in a guillotine, he's not going to be beheaded. He's not going to be sentenced to death. He's not going to be executed. No, he is sentenced to the worst thing imaginable. He is sentenced to eternal life. He has to go through this cycle again and again and again. And he has to live with himself, with the animus. That's the only part that's left of him. He eliminated the anima. He eliminated the shadow. And now he is only the animus. He is an incomplete human being for eternity. And this is the worst punishment. And then there's also one more thing. It's like the icing on this terrible, horrible cake. He is ridiculed. He is sentenced to be ridiculed. And this is the worst thing for Harry. Because he has no sense of humor. He takes himself too seriously. And people laughing at him. This is just like killing him over and over again. And this is actually how he killed the wolf, by the way. And now Hesse writes, Meine Herren, vor Ihnen steht Harry Haller, angeklagt und schuldig befunden des mutwegen Missbrauchs unseres magischen Theaters. Haller hat nicht nur die hohe Kunst beleidigt, indem er unseren schönen Bildersaal mit der sogenannten Wirklichkeit verwechselte und ein gespiegeltes Mädchen mit einem gespiegelten Messer totgestochen hat. Er hat sich außerdem unseres Theaters humorloserweise als einer Selbstmordmechanik zu bedienen, die Absicht gezeigt. Gentlemen, Harry Haller is standing in front of you. He is accused and convicted of deliberately abusing our magical theater. Not only has Harry offended our high art, confusing our gallery with the so-called reality, and by killing a mirrored girl with a mirrored knife. He also tried to abuse our theater in a absolutely humorless way in order to kill himself. That was his intention. Wir verurteilen vorgestern den Haller zur Strafe des ewigen Lebens und zum zwölfstündigen Entzug der Einzugsbewegung unser Theater. Auch kann dem Angeklagten die Strafe einmaligen ausgelacht werden, nicht erlassen werden. Meine Herren, stimmen Sie an. Eins, zwei, drei. Therefore, we sentence Hala to the punishment of eternal life 
and to a 12-hour ban from our theater. And we cannot spare him the punishment of being laughed at. So, gentlemen, let's go. One, two, three. So he receives his punishment, and then he suddenly wakes up. And next to him is Mozart. And then he realizes it's not Mozart, it's actually Pablo, the jazz musician. He's not the classical musician, the genius of music, the peak of classical music. No, it's just like that jazz musician that gives him drugs, who improvises, who just lives a bohemian lifestyle. And what Harry says then, his last words basically, Einmal würde ich das Lachen lernen. Pablo wartet auf mich. Mozart wartet auf mich. One day, I would learn how to laugh. Pablo was waiting for me. Mozart was waiting for me. So what he says there is very interesting because he actually realizes that he has to find a sense of humor, to develop a sense of humor, to go on in this life. And the characters of Mozart and Pablo, they merge. They become one. Because in the end, music is music. And he realizes that. So it's not about cultural superiority. No, it's about the soul. It's about the feeling that's invested in it, that you put into it. So he realizes that. So how can you judge the quality of art anyway? If someone puts their heart into it, what does it mean then to say, wow, this is not like high culture. What is it? And in a way, he knows Pablo and he realizes that this man is happier than himself. And since Haller represents this high culture, but he's so unhappy, and this man he meets there, you know, living this bohemian lifestyle, has no money, but he's happy. Which way of life is better? Problem is, killing the wolf is not the answer. He actually looks into the mirror and realizes he is the wolf. That's a part of himself. He kills the wolf by laughing at him. Because if you laugh, you're not afraid. It's conquering your fear. So laughter is a sort of therapy. Don't take yourself too seriously. Laugh at the things that you're afraid of. Laugh them away. You laugh at them, they disappear, they just die. So laughter is also a kind of therapy that can heal your fear of death because although Harry, he had decided to end his own life at the age of 50, he also realizes that his greatest fear is the fear of death. But now he laughs death in the face. And that means he becomes invincible, immortal in a way. And so how does he learn actually? Well, remember, Mozart laughs at him. He laughs about him. Why is that? Well, these people are immortal. Mozart and Goethe are immortals because they are forever in our cultural memory. They are history. They are in themselves cultural references. They are the greats of all time. So, I mean, yes, they're dead, but they're still there. So in a way, they're not dead. And Mozart teaches him to laugh at himself too. So this kind of like the sense of humor liberates Harry and it also means he gets distance from himself and distance from the world. And this enables his further development. He has a second chance to grow. He can become a different human being, although he's already middle-aged. It doesn't matter. He gets a second lease on life. He can start a new chapter. And this is something that he had to learn the hard way. The problem is, he's not the only one who has to face these crises. And especially at the time when the Steppenwolf was written, many people had to deal with a very, very dire situation. The economy was bad, society was falling apart, and if the environment is horrible, of course, your private life also gets affected by that. And next time, I'm going to talk about specific problems at that time, the 1920s, and I will point out what Heidegger talked about, I will point out what Freud talked about, Hesse, 
and then we move on to Nietzsche. So thank you very much for watching. See you next time.